Praise God. Thank you. you. May be seated. Now, we're going to do things just a little bit differently this afternoon because here at Times Square Church, we have the incredible privilege of ordaining one of our own. We are an ordaining body at Times Square Church, and uh, in the 28 years that we've been at church, we've not used that privilege. Uh, we feel that Pastor Hector Vega has exhibited the signs of a called man of God and uh, the evidence of the inner working of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of a life that's set apart by God. And so today we're going to officially recognize that by laying hands on him and officially ordaining him as a minister uh, ordained by Times Square Church. And praise God for that. Before we do that, I've asked Pastor Hector to come. Most people get ordained before they're a pastor. He was a pastor seven years already and is getting ordained. Well, the Bible says don't lay hands suddenly on anyone. In other words, don't suddenly promote somebody. So we know that this man is called of God. But I've asked him to come and take the next 20 minutes and share his testimony with you. You're going to be amazed at what God has done, where he's taken him from, and uh, we are going to be witnesses of where he's going to be taken in the future by the Spirit of God. So, Pastor Hector, come. God bless you this morning, this afternoon. Praise the Lord. I don't know if you can understand the how improbable it is that I'm standing before you today on this day. Um, as I was sitting there, I was reminded that one of the first times that I entered this church, I, I sat up here with my, my wife, who was at that time my girlfriend, and uh, we sat up there, and I remember hearing Pastor Dave preach a message that so moved me, and I was in bondage. I, I needed to be delivered, and I had a case hanging over me, and I, and I just thought, this man sounds like he hears from God, and if he prays for me, they'll do away with the case. And uh, so, okay, okay. And so, um, what ended up happening was, uh, I told her I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get to the back and see if he'll pray for me. And she said they're not gonna let you back there. I mean, there's security. I said, don't you worry about that. I know how to get through stuff. So, <laughs> I mean, I made it back here to Pastor Dave, and I said, Pastor Dave, I need. I need you to pray for me. And uh, I, I got this case hanging over me, and uh, I, just, I just wanted to go away. And he looked at me with the, with the eyes that he had. I don't know if you remember the kind of eyes that he had. And he looked at me, and he said, son, are you looking for Jesus with all your heart? And I was like, Jesus, no, I need you to pray for the case. I'm, I'm, I, I, that's what I'm coming up here for. And he was like, if you ain't looking for Jesus, I ain't praying for you. <laughs> And I was like, what kind of a church is this? They don't pray for you here? Uh, he said, I'm going to pray that Jesus get a hold of your heart. That's what I'm going to pray. And uh, I, I went away, and, I, and my wife said, how did it go? I said, he didn't pray for me. And I was, she was like, well, that's, that's, I said, we ain't never coming back to this place. <laughs> I, I, miss, I miss Pastor Dave. I miss him. And so I grew up in this neighborhood as a broken um, teenager, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, spent um, many years of my life running the streets of New York City, uh, Hell's Kitchen right here, and uh, I was just strung out on bazooka, which many of you don't know what that was, there was a uh, a residue of the cocaine that they cooked in Colombia, and they would ship it here, and we would put it in marijuana. At a very young age, I started with the alcohol marijuana. Uh, before you know it, I was uh, just on cocaine, transporting drugs from Queens, bringing it back here. I had a little gang uh, that we had two stores here in the neighborhood on 48th Street and uh, 10th Avenue and another one here on 46, and we would pack the, the drugs in the back of the arcade games, and, and we would have codes to sell drugs. and. Uh, I, I was cutting school. I, I used to love to play baseball, but uh, the love and the grip that the drugs had on my life was stronger. And I grew up in a dysfunctional home and uh, um, really not a lot of structure. My parents, you know, started to mess around as well. And so, as you could imagine, I had to sell drugs to support my habit. And uh, I remember one day um, <clears throat> I was in Rikers Island in C-76, and uh, I was in a cell for 23 hours a day. And I remember one night I went to bed, and it was just like any other night, but 
uh, I woke up around three or four in the morning. There was a lot of chains, uh, keys and stuff just rattling and a lot of walkie talkies and a lot of noise. And so when I woke up, um, there was a lot of correction officers in front of my cell. And what had happened was there was a man, a young man that was uh, in the cell before me who committed suicide. He, he took his life. And uh, when, ha when that happens in the prisons, they usually um, lock everything down. You can't call home. You can't do anything until they investigate if something happened as a result of somebody in there. And so we couldn't call home for a couple of days. But, but it gets worse. You see, the gentleman's name was Jose Vega. And my name was Hector Vega. And so Rikers Island sent a priest to my house and told my parents that I had committed suicide. And so for two days, they thought that Nico was dead. That was my street name, Nico. But, you know, that was spiritually, that's where I was. I was dead. I was, I was gone. I was, um, there was no hope for me. There really was no hope for me. I, I remember just every time I went to jail, I just thought this is, I'm just going to gain a couple of pounds and then I'm going to come back and get back on the run. I was a career criminal uh, by the standards of society. And I mean, I have more than six felonies on my record. Uh, I have nothing but a jailhouse GED. And yet, um, we know that we serve a God who calls and does things that are great. Amen. He, he changes, he takes our ashes and he converts them into beauty. Amen. <clears throat> and um, I, I didn't know who Jesus was, but I, I, I ran into this young lady who knew about Jesus and she started to tell me about him. But uh, I didn't really have any faith in programs or anything like that. And so one day she said, you know, why don't you go to a Christian program? Um, you know, it's probably something that you've never experienced before, but I didn't want anything to do with it. But there was a group of, of members in the choir here many years ago. It was a, a Spanish ensemble and her sister was part of that choir. And they started to pray for me while I was on the street. They didn't know who I was, but they knew my name and God knew my name. And they started to pray for me and pray. And when one day I decided to go to this Christian program in Newark, New Jersey, of all places, uh, I went to Newark and, uh, it was a small program, two women, uh, that ran this program, and, but they knew the power of God. I mean, these women, they, they, they knew the power of God. I saw demon-possessed people set free in that place. I, I saw people get up, you know, and couldn't walk and stuff like that. And the first night I was there, I, I, I told them that I couldn't stay because I needed a detox. I had a heroin habit of a couple hundred dollars, and uh, they said, look, uh, let us pray for you, and if in the morning you still need a hospital, we'll take you. And so they said, raise your hands. And I did, you know, I, what, do I, what do I have to lose? And I put my hands up. They prayed. Nothing happened. There was no, sh no earth shattering uh, anything. But uh, that next morning I woke up and I didn't have the withdrawals that I normally have when I'm in, in heroin. I, I didn't have the, the, the body or anything like that. So God had begun to start doing something. Amen. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about miracles. Amen. I'm talking about stuff that's happening right now. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I stayed at that program and I started to see the power of God for the first time. Now, you, you understand, I didn't grow up by the piano singing hallelujah or any of that stuff. I grew up on the streets here when it was Hell's Kitchen. Right now, it's nice and calm. You can't really imagine what it used to look like. But 42nd Street was a very different place. Peep shows, pimps, prostitutes, drug dealers, perverts anything, everything out there. Everybody had a game. Everybody had a scam. And uh, that's what I grew up in. But, uh, but when I went to this program, I started to sense the presence of God. I started, and one day they were just praying over me and the presence of God fell on me. It just felt, I, I just felt light and I, and I went back. Now, I don't know if you can find this in the Bible or not, but I'm telling you what happened to me. I, I, I went down. Nobody pushed me. I just went down and I, I couldn't get up. I felt like there was something over me, and it, it, but it felt clean. It felt good. And uh, I could hear them still praying, but it was very, very far. And um, when I got up, I, I just, I just, I don't know. I felt light. I felt different. And uh, so that was the beginning of my journey with God. But I wish that would have been the end uh, or that would have been the end of my time in drugs. But you see, I left that program nine months in, and I said, God, if you're real, you're going to stop me from using drugs. I don't believe this is real. I'm just here in this program. And I left. I went to the streets, back to New York City. And I remember coming here on Ninth Avenue where all the drug dealers were and uh, looking for drugs, asking people for drugs. And one by one, they began to shoo me away. And they began to tell me a different excuse as to why they weren't going to give me any heroin. And I was like, this is, isn't this something? When I have my stuff, I would give, you know, and they're turning me away. One guy told me, ain't you on a program? We ain't selling you nothing. Get out of here. 
<laughs> I remember going to uh, my mom's house and uh, my dad's house and uh, getting a bag of heroin uh, from there and uh, using it in the hallway. But, you know, I sat down and I'm thinking, for, you know, in five minutes I'm going to feel the effects because I'm clean. Uh, Five minutes went by, 10 minutes went by. I couldn't, I couldn't sense anything was happening. I'm thinking to myself, man, my dad is selling some junk. This stuff doesn't do anything to me. <laughs> but at no point did I acknowledge maybe, maybe God is doing something. Maybe, maybe God is sovereignly intervening and showing me that he can step in whenever he wants to. Uh, but I stayed on the streets. I got worse than I ever did. Uh, my wife was pregnant now. My, my, my oldest son, Nicholas, um, who already about six months old and, uh, I remember uh, staying out there and I didn't want anything to do with God. At this point, I felt like, God, why would he want me back? I just turned my back on him. And so why, how can I come back to him now? And so the last time I got arrested, uh, I remember sitting in the car slumped over and I just let out this huge sigh and I said, I, th I thought it was over. I, I was just so tired. And uh, I, f I, put, I put that down as God rescued me that night. He rescued me, he sent cops to find me and said, enough is enough. I'm bringing you in. And so he just snatched me off the streets, if you will. And, uh, and then I had a dream that changed my life, uh, where God revealed himself sovereignly in my life. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to share it all right now because I've, some of you have heard it, but uh, just know that when God came into that dream and he, he spoke to me in his word, I, I was so excited because I knew that God was speaking to me again and he could forgive me again. And I remember calling my wife and telling her, you know, God is talking to me again. And and uh, I think you and I, you know, we still got some stuff that we have to do. I think we're going to be together again. And she was like, well, God hasn't told me any of that stuff. <laughs> He's going to have to come down here and talk to me. I was like, <laughs> Jesus. Well, we've been married now for 23 years. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> There was so much uh, that I went through uh, just being in the crack houses. I remember one, one thing that I got to share with you. I remember just early on when I was in the grips of this and I would go with my dad. My dad would try to keep me. He did the best he could and I love my dad and I don't want to blame him for anything. But I remember being in a base house one day and we were packing heroin bags and uh, um, he looked at me and he said, uh, he had the crack pipe in his hand. He said, is this, is this what you want? Is this what you want to use? And uh, I, I think I just mumbled something, kind of like an affirmative. And he passed me that pipe and he says, I think, I think I'm going to regret this for the rest of my life. And uh, it was 10 long years where I felt like I was never going to be free. I was just in the shadows. I, I didn't think I could ever be free. But one day Jesus came in and changed it all. Changed it all. Changed it all. I came home in 1996 for the last time. I never went, back, never went back to prison again. And I remember coming in and I said, I'm going to just go to Times Square Church. Whenever they're open, I'm going to be there. I'm just going to stand there, whatever God is going to do. And, uh, uh, you know, he began to do a work in my life. I started working with Pastor Patrick in the teen ministry uh, for a season. And then I left Pastor Patrick. I went to the Raven truck. And then from there, I started serving in uh, Elder Jerry's uh, prison ministry. And uh, we put a code in there that everybody that joined had to be bald. So we, we just, you know, <laughs> it seemed like that's all we attracted, only bald people uh, to the ministry. Uh, but, but it was a good thing. When I started, it was only like three or four of us. And uh, it just exploded. Uh, and so I started serving here. I went on mission trips whenever I got a chance. I went abroad. I, I, I was in Nigeria. I was in Burundi. I, I, I've, been, I've been to Egypt, India, Greece, uh, all over the world. Just a matter of fact, I've been to some weird places too. I was just in Wichita, Kansas and, 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 and Homerville, Georgia, <laughs> preaching the gospel of Jesus. Only God can do that. Amen. Holy God. <laughs> oh. It's been an awesome, awesome journey. Uh, it's been an awesome journey. And then, you know, I started working here cleaning the streets, the guys in the red suits, Times Square bid. And Times Square used to have a, a, a job, uh, a couple of positions with them. And so I was one of the ones that started working there uh, through Pastor Richie. And uh, I got a job 
with them for about six months, and then I was faithful in the little. Amen. I gave it to God, and then I started working at an insurance company as a part-time employee there. And uh, I, was not an empl- I was not an employee for long, and four months in, they were going to lay us off. And everybody there was union, and I was not. So I was going to lose my job. And so my manager, she just, God gave me favor with her, and she started calling around the company to say, we got to keep this young man. He's a good worker. Let's keep him. You know, he's got a family. And uh, sent me on an interview where the job was already spoken for by somebody's uh, son that worked in the company. And so these women interviewed me. And at the end of the interview, I remember Magda Cruz looked at me and she said, hey, Gene, tell so-and-so that his son is going to have to find another job. We're going to hire this kid. (laughs) Uh, And so I became a full-time employee in this company. And uh, nine months later, I get promoted to be a customer service representative. And I was faithful there. And then about a year later, I get promoted to be a quality analyst. And then about a year later, I get promoted again to be a corporate trainer. And then about another 18 months later, I get promoted to be a supervisor. And then about another year later, I get promoted to be a manager. And then about, you know, uh, in 2009, I get called by Times Square Church to say, hey, um, we, uh, we feel that you're supposed to be the next pastor at East Harlem. And why don't you come up and meet with us? And I'm thinking to myself, they must be smoking something. <laughs> I mean, I didn't go to, I didn't go to seminary. What, who, what, how did my name get in the list? I didn't apply for anything. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> Pastor Carter was talking about how, you know, I've been pastoring for seven years. You know, sometimes I used to be waiting for the car to pick me back up and say, hey, we made a mistake. Come on back now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, I remember Pastor Will told me something very profound. He said, listen. Now, they, God chose you to go up there and be the pastor. Go up there and be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. If God wanted somebody else, he would have sent somebody else, but he's sending you. And so you go up there and, and you give it all you got. And I, was, and I was thinking to myself, I got nothing but two sermons in my briefcase, and there's 52 Sundays, man. What am I going to do the other Sunday? <laughs> and then Wednesdays, too. Wednesdays, oh, Lord. <laughs> Well, it's been seven years, and he's filled up my mouth for seven years. Amen? (laughs) Amen. God is good all the time. And uh, so in 2009, when I got called to be the uh, pastor, I also get called from my job while I was in a trip in Egypt. And my boss says, "Uh, we got to make changes when you get back. This department is a wreck. Perhaps you could help me do it as the new director of the entire claims operation. So I got promoted now. Now, yeah, I had 140 people working for me, uh, nothing at a jailhouse GED. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, but you, the claims department in that company was the engine. Every, everything that got done in that company came through claims. So I have vice presidents coming to me. It's like a Joseph story. They're coming to me. How are we going to get this done, Hector? And uh, only God can do that. Amen. Only God can do that. Uh, So let me, let me wrap this up if I can. Let me wrap this up if I can. Seven years. I feel like the road is getting narrower. The standard is getting higher. I feel like I'm no longer called to be in the business world. I feel like God is telling me uh, to zero in on my family, my sons, and uh, the the beautiful church that God has uh, allowed me to be a part of. Some of them are here today, and I thank them for allowing me to be their pastor. And, and some of you who have been in my life, you know, all, uh, Pastor Teresa, Pastor Patrick, Pastor William, oh, my God, how many, how many things, uh, Pastor Ham, Pastor Carter, I mean, Elder Jerry, Elder Chooks, all of these people in my life, and I've been blessed. And uh, I can only say, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Amen. Um, And so one last thing, uh, I also got called at the end of uh, 2014, I had got laid off in 2013, and in 2014, uh, uh, an old friend called me about an opportunity in a homeless shelter in Newark, New Jersey, Um, and uh, you know, I kind of felt like this was an opportunity to keep paying bills and stuff like that, not be a burden to the church, and uh, I went there, I've been there now for a year pastoring and still and leading this homeless ministry uh in my first year there we the first year before i got there we fed forty-three thousand meals my first year there we fed eighty-seven thousand meals 
Uh, we sleep about 40, 44 men every night. Not only that, we have a, a recovery program for men, and we just graduated nine guys who were homeless 12 months before on the streets, but now on fire for Jesus and working. Amen? Uh, so if you, I mean, if you are here today and you're thinking your life is a mess, I know what it is. I've been there. If you're thinking, uh, I'm a failure, I've made so many mistakes, God can't possibly use me. Uh, I, I can only tell, even today I was coming in and I'm thinking to myself, well, I should just really let somebody else do this because, I mean, you know, if they only knew how many mistakes I'm making. But God knows what I'm trying to do, and my trust and my faith is in Him. And uh, I don't have anything altogether. I'm still believing Him, trusting in His Word. Uh, even at that homeless shelter, I'm, I'm managing a $2 million budget. I have no accounting skills. I, 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 I don't know how we're doing it. I started out with $150,000 in debt, and we ended the year with $150,000 in the black. Amen? So I, I, don't, I don't know where it is. So Jesus can do it. Jesus can do it. Amen? Can we give God some praise today? Amen. Praise God. Well, Pastor Hector, I want to read to you from the scriptures, the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 16. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I thank God for the knowledge of that. You know, it's interesting, an ex-cop is ordaining an ex-con, you know? We should, we should be cops and cons on the road. <laughs> we could start our own reality show. Yeah. Because <laughs> in the natural, this should not be happening. <laughs> but it shows that the ground is level at the cross. And it's really the hungry heart that gets the victory. And God doesn't call us because we have a huge resume on the wall. He calls us because he looks at the heart. And he sees, and when he looked at Pastor Hector, he saw a man who would go full force into what he was called to do. Just like the Apostle Paul, when he was in error, he went full force into error. But when he found Christ as his Savior, he, there was nothing could stop him. And I, I feel that kind of a touch of heaven is on your life. And so it's a privilege for us. You're the first man to be ordained by Times Square Church as a, as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ with all of the rights and privileges to publish and preach and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ, to marry and bury, as the case may be, and to counsel and uh, with the full authority of this church body. And so, Pastor Hector, I want to ask you today, uh, do you accept the Bible as God's inspired, infallible, inerrant, immutable, indestructible, and indispensable word? Do you understand the requirements, the responsibilities, and the realities that are about to be placed on you by being ordained and set apart as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ? I do. Are you ready and willing to accept and assume the responsibility to peruse, preach, practice the Word of God with boldness, to minister to the needs of those to whom you are sent without partiality, and to give yourself sacrificially and without reserve to the educating, the edification, and the equipping of the body of Christ? We endeavor to be diligent in the study of God's word, instant and faithful in prayer, an example in Christian piety and discipline before your people and the community, in order that your life might be a worthy Christian example and that upon your ministry the blessing of God may rest. Recognizing the sacred responsibility of your call and aware of your own human weakness, will you seek the leadership and empowerment of the Holy Spirit in order that you may be a faithful minister of him who has called you. You know, Pastor, none of us can do this on our own. Uh, we need the strength of God every day. And you already know it, but there will be days when you need it more even than others. We may be just a little more aware of it some days than others. But we need the strength of God. Before ordaining you, Hector Vega, I charge you to pursue the word of God. Paul charged Timothy, he said, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, meditate on these things, 
Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Paul further charged Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I also charge you to practice the word of God, not just to read it or study it, but let it read you and let your body, the very essence of who you are, become a demonstration of the word of God and what the word of God teaches and says. I charge you to preach the word of God. You're called to be a preacher. Some people assume the call to preach and do very little about it, becoming entangled with various professions of the world, and their ministry becomes a sideline. I believe it's proper to include in this charge that if you're called to be a preacher, then be a preacher. You're not called to be a politician, a school teacher, a businessman, or anything else. You are a man of God, and you're called to preach the word of God. Paul's final instruction to Timothy was, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. They'll turn their ears away from the truth. But you be a watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. What a pleasure and a privilege it is to walk this walk with you. Pastors and elders, if you'd come, please, at this time. We're going to pray, officially ordain our brother. If you would get on your knees, please. I'd appreciate that very much. Father God, in Jesus' name, we ordain this man of God. We recognize, Lord, that ordination is your choice, not ours. All we are called to do is agree with your calling. And so, Lord, we bear witness in our hearts today that you have chosen Hector Vega as a preacher, teacher, publisher, and defender of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask, O oh God, that you would come upon his physical body in a new way, a stronger way, a deeper way than he's ever known in his lifetime. God, surround his home, surround his wife and his children, Lord, and let the blessing of heaven be on his family. We recognize that not only is he called, but his family are called as well. And so God, help his family to know you, to understand you, to walk with you, Father. We thank you for this. We thank you, Lord, that as we fight for others, you promise that you will fight for us. And we bless you for that, O oh God. God Almighty, let your Holy Spirit rest on this man. Let everything he does be birthed and born in the Spirit. Guide him, guard him, O oh God. O oh Jesus Christ, keep him, Lord, from ever becoming bitter from the wounds that do come through ministry. I pray, God, that he will only grow deeper, deeper, no matter what happens in the days ahead, Lord, that it will produce a depth in this man, O oh God, a depth of reasoning and understanding, a compassion, a voice that speaks for God, something that calls people to the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you make him tender, Lord, recognizing that you've been tender with him, and your tenderness, as David said, has made him great. And so, God, keep him a tender man when he steps in the pulpit. Let him not drive the people of God when he's been led himself by great grace. I thank you for this, Father, with all my heart. Oh, Jesus, touch him. I pray, God, that we might be a people who will stand with him here at Times Square Church. Stand behind him. Encourage him. Lift him up, oh, God. Pray for him. Never forget him, oh, God, in the work that you've entrusted to his hands. We recognize the call. We find it an awesome and honorable privilege to lay hands on him this day. And declare him before all of men who are here today a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, thank you for the great encouragement it is to all of us, Lord. Knowing, Lord, knowing, God, that your, your choices are based on the heart, not on diplomas. Father, we thank you for this with all of our heart today. Bless him, keep him, strengthen him. Oh God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother Hector, you can, you can hang this up beside your jailhouse GED.